Hey, what's up guys? It's Mike with Alpha Reptile back with another video today and today we are doing another question and answer Tuesday or Q&A Tuesday because it sounds better that way. With that being said, uh, I want to thank you guys all for the support on the last one. I mentioned moving to Australia and a couple different things. I really did want to thank you guys for showing so much support and uh, just kind of validating my concern as well as kind of encouraging me to do some work and put in some vlogs and stuff like that. So I really want to thank you guys very much for doing so. I am going to get into your questions from a last Q&A Tuesday. Uh, this guy here. You can see it on the screen now. Yeah, you guys had some really good ones last week, so let's jump into this week. Nicole Fowler, what do you think is the best substrate for a blue tongue skink? I'm setting up an enclosure before I get one. I really wanna make sure I have everything perfect before I look into purchasing one. I've had one years and years ago before they were super expensive and absolutely loved him. It's really my dream animal, so I want to make sure I do everything the best way possible. Nicole, thanks for your question, first off. I guess my tip to you would just be to, uh, well, A, decide which kind you're going to get, which locale, I guess, um, which species, I suppose, as well. Uh, if you're getting an Aussie one, then obviously care requirements are going to be different than a Indonesian one. But for my Indo, I have a mixture of Cypress mulch as well as the Zilla, um, it's like forest floor or jungle jungle mix, I think is what it's called. I, I really haven't bought it in quite a while so I, I don't know but that's kind of my recommendation for uh, an Aussie species they like it a lot drier and slightly less humid obviously um, so you can do dried cypress mulch um, there's a couple different options out there but just decide which species you're going to get and then go from there Alrighty, JTB Reptiles. Thanks for watching, man. You comment on pretty much every video. I really appreciate that. Here's a set of questions for this time. He says, what's your favorite plant and why? What's your favorite piece of tech for your herbs? Ooh, that's a good question. Uh, when you go to Oz, which species will you look into first? Uh, so my favorite vivarium plant and why are definitely bromeliads. Um, you guys have seen me do unboxing videos of like 50 bromeliads and some other cool plants. Uh, those are definitely my favorite. There is some Margravia and stuff like that that is really, really cool as well. Um, but bromeliads are, are definitely where it's at for me. My favorite piece of tech for my herps is definitely this guy right here. This is the temp gun. You guys can see it, maybe. There you go. It just reads the temperature really, really easily and I think it is a necessity for every reptile keeper out there. I don't think you should waste your money on the ones from like Exoterra and stuff because they're more expensive if not a similar price to the temp guns and these are way more reliable so as when I move to Australia what species will I look into first I'm not going to be keeping any reptiles when I move to Australia um, I'll be doing some herping I'll be doing some exploring I'll go to zoos I'll go to different collections I'll do that kind of stuff but I think for me Australia I really want it to be kind of it's way too deep for a YouTube video but, but I'll say it anyway um, I just kind of want to find like who I am outside of reptiles. Um, it's something that I've grown with and you guys will see the video tomorrow. It's just like how much the reptile hobby has influenced me. But I really, I, I don't, I, like me and reptiles go hand in hand. That's not anything to be like ashamed about, but I think it is important to kind of learn who I am without this in my life. And of course, like I'll still be texting my parents about them all the time and double checking with friends on how the animals they are looking after are doing. But yeah, while I'm in Australia, I just kind of want to take a break, live life to what I want it to be and not really have the responsibility of having to come home and look after a whole zoo of animals. So. I don't know if that really makes sense or not, or if, you know, it's a little deep for a YouTube video, but that's just kind of the reality of it. Uh, Purtle the Turtle asks, will I ever consider getting a Diamondback Terrapin? No. Um, they're really cool. We have four or five of them at work, and I think they're awesome animals, but they're just not something that is really super appealing to me. I really do have the species of turtle that I like to keep. Um, I'm I'm kind of more geared towards the land-based turtles rather than the purely aquatic or mostly aquatic turtles. Um, that's just me. I would love to own a pig nose turtle or a fly river turtle. Um, those are kind of my dream turtles. Uh, I don't. They're technically not allowed here in Alberta, so. 
I, I don't have one, and I probably will never own one, but if I move somewhere else, I will definitely try and get one. Thanks for the question, Purtle. That's a hilarious name as well. <laughs> oh, it's not Purtle the Turtle, dang it. It's Purdue the Turtle, dang. The next question comes from Jude Curran. Uh, he asks, why don't I keep more tortoises like Russian? I'll just show you why. Where do I have space for another tortoise? The answer is, I, r I really don't. I just don't have space for any more tortoises. Um, I know if slash when I move to Australia, uh, my parents do want to kind of upgrade him and move Sheldon upstairs. Um, so that way they are a little bit more interactive with him. Uh, and then I think in that sense, he'd get basically like a dining room table as a pen which will be sick, uh, but we'll see what happens when I actually do move. But yeah, that's the main reason why. I just don't have space. And tortoises, they're really cool, but I don't plan on breeding them. I don't really see the point of having more than one, really. When it comes to the tortoises, I just, one's enough. Now, if I had a setup like Camp Kennan, then I would have like Camp Kennan. If I lived in Florida, I would have a bunch of tortoises, but I just don't have the space. The next question comes from Christopher's Tanks. Have you ever bred bean weevils? They're weevils, technically. Um, for your darts, I've been thinking of trying them as a backup feeder. You don't like rice flower beetles. Uh, I have, I've done it a couple times. I don't really see the point in it. I mean, f as a variety to the diet, okay, I understand, but really only your Tinctorius can eat it anyway, or some of the larger dart frogs will eat them anyway. So for me, it was just not worth the time. I didn't keep up with them. I just kind of fed them off and let them die out. Andy Brown hits us with the next question. Yeah, so I've been watching your videos since my old room. Whoa, uh, you've been a massive inspiration to me and my animals. Well, thank you. I'm glad that you enjoy the channel and you enjoy what I produce. My question is, what is it that draws you to the species that you keep that generally tend to be more unusual species and harder to find species of reptile and amphibian? Honestly, the drive for it is just something new. I really like learning. I really like testing out new things. I like experimenting and I really enjoy just the whole process of learning a new species, something that's not super common. Uh, and typically I like to find a species and if I like the species, it doesn't matter whether it's common or not, I enjoy keeping them. I mean, just as an example, like the Geomita spangleri, or down there I have the Ebonavia ninguis. Those are a Madagascan species of gecko that aren't really kept in Canada. Uh, I did have to import them and I mean, I think I ended up getting two females, so that kind of sucks, but it's just kind of crazy to me that the hobby is built based off of so few animals and I get it, they're like beginner animals, but I really like to see diversity and kind of whole like richness, I guess, in a collection rather than just having like 40 ball pythons. It's like, okay, dude, cool. You keep 20 ball pythons in a bin, like great. I, I That's not what I'm in the hobby for. Like I bred the baby Euromastix and that's super cool, but I, it's just kind of like to go along with the hobby. I'd rather have cool, more rare species that I'm interested in than having a bunch of just really, really common animals. The next question is a quick run from Thomas Van Ostrand. Uh, he asks, stay free. <laughs> uh, what about electric blue geckos? Would I keep them? So the Ligodactylus Williams eye or the electric blue day gecko, it's technically not a day gecko, just throwing that out there. Uh, I have owned them before and they are really, really cool pets. They're now CITES 1, so you can't export them anymore. Uh, you can't move them between countries. So that really sucks, but um, yeah, they're really cool species. I bred them in the past, probably like five or six years ago now, more than that actually, probably like eight or 10 years ago. It, it was a long time ago that I bred them. So they are really cool. If you can find them, great, but uh, yeah. They, they are escape artists, so keep that in mind. Alrighty, Cody McMillan. What's up, man? For next week, are you ever going to get the podcast going? 
Thanks, I'll talk about that. Uh, how did you like the Wild Stuff apparel shirts? You should partner with them for some of your merch. And he just gave me some extra feedback on what I asked last video. Uh, am I ever going to get the podcast going? I really hope so. We'll have to see. I really want to get it off the ground. It's just another thing that I'll have to be responsible for. And unless I have like a co-host or something, which might happen, uh, it'll be really tough for me to do the YouTube, the travel, the looking after all the animals, working like 25 hours a week or so, uh, and then just like the podcast as well. So I don't know if I'll get it started. I really want to. I don't really have a good answer for that, to be honest. What did I think of the Wild Stuff apparel shirts? To be honest, I love the designs. I love the cause. It's really cool to kind of spread the coolness. The coolness? It's really cool to spread the uh, like word of Wild Stuff Apparel. I'm not gonna lie, they're not like the most high quality shirts. They're just like the Gildan, Gliden, Gildan. I think it's Gildan, uh, like cotton shirts. So they're they're kind of rough. Like they're not like a Hurley shirt or some of the more comfortable shirts. They are a little bit more kind of stale, I suppose is like the word that I use for them. But they are cool enough to wear the like awesome designs that they have outweigh the the I guess slightly lower quality on them. I, I really hope they can kick it up and, and produce some really nice stuff even if it means paying a little bit more and you get like a really high quality shirt that's I would personally do that I know not everybody would but I think it's definitely something that you should offer or they should offer I guess. The next question comes from Harold I, I'm not even gonna try with that last name not a chance. Is it hard to keep a really heavily planted aquarium? Um, he finds them so beautiful, but he wishes that, or he's a little bit scared. So I don't think so. It's not hard. I neglect this aquarium like crazy. You just have to pick some slightly less demanding plants and go for a, a, kind of a lower light setup. I personally will probably never do like a high light, high CO2 setup just because it is so much extra work um, maintaining the CO2 and stuff like that. I don't think it's very hard. I mean, I'll do a water change once every like two weeks. Um, I'll scrub it the same time. Uh, I let that thing go and do itself. Cohen, uh, Bunton asks a pretty interesting question. He says, what would you do if you weren't making YouTube videos? Probably would still be doing the same stuff just without making YouTube videos. <laughs> like this isn't a full-time job for me. Uh, I have made some really cool connections through it, so that's awesome. Uh, but beyond that, I, I probably would just be doing my thing. I'd have a little less stress in my life, <laughs> especially during May. But you know what? Uh, I love it. I love making videos and I love educating people. So that's something that I think is really important. The next question comes from Thomas Harrison. He asks, what caused you to get into reptiles and YouTube? YouTube, again, it was just kind of a means of learning. Uh, I think that's one of the coolest things about YouTube. Sure, there's some entertainment, but there's also a lot of like tutorials and how to. So that's probably my favorite thing about YouTube and what got me into it. Uh, I just saw people making YouTube channels almost 10 years ago now, I think. Or this might be nine years on YouTube for me. Honestly, it's just something that I really like to do and I saw an opportunity in I could spread what I know to people that might not know it. And now that I've grown and done more research and accumulated more knowledge, I think it's even more important that I share it with people out there. So that's why I'm doing it. As for reptiles, it was definitely Steve Irwin. As a child, you can even ask my parents, like I was insanely obsessed with dinosaurs and that just kind of like naturally progressed me into the reptile hobby and uh, yeah here we are. One of the last questions comes from Sam Leaps. He says what species have I never worked with but I want to in the future? Uh, definitely tree monitors. Um, I would like to do some larger chameleons at some point as well and some of the large obligate egg feeder dart frogs because the Faga histrionica are just insane. Uh, I have dealt with them at Biopod when I worked there, but I've never kept them in my own room. So that's what I definitely, that's kind of like my, I guess, top whatever it was, three or four, whatever I listed off. Scales and Tails comes up with the next question. He says, or she, I don't know, whoever you are, says, what amphibian would you most likely end up owning? Cruzio Hyla Craspidopus is probably my next frog that I'm going to get because they're awesome. And I really hope I can get my hands on some. They're called the fringed tree frog. Fringed tree frog. Uh, they're really, really cool. 
and they're something that I would love to own. Supreme Gecko says, question for next week, could you provide two to three good starter dart frogs and two to three plants for dart frog noobs? Two to three good starter dart frogs are the any Dendrobates Tinctorius, so Azurius, there's a whole list of them, any Tinctorius, uh, as well as any Erratus, but typically they end up being a little bit more shy. And then the third one is the Dendrobates Leucomelos, or the Bumblebee Dart Frog. Those are the three that I would recommend, just to start with, just to kind of dabble. You can do some of the thumbnails and stuff like that. They are very similar care, but it's just a little bit more robust and easier to feed the larger Dart Frogs. As for two to three good plants, just use common plants. Not everybody has to hop into crazy rare expensive plants right off the bat. To be honest, Pothos is great, Philodendron is great, um, Nerve Plant is really awesome too, uh, Bromeliads of course, those are pretty easily accessible if you know where to look, so yeah, those are kind of my recommendations for plants for a beginner. Hannah Bradfield asks, best beginner tortoise, uh, any of the Testudoi? Any of the Testudo genus, um, so Horsefieldi, Hermini, or Russian tortoise, uh, Herman's tortoise, uh, Greek tortoises are great. A lot of the Mediterranean ones are going to suit uh, my climate a lot better. If you're in Florida and you have the backyard space and stuff, you can do things like um, red foots, cherry heads, yellow foots, long gateds. Uh, you could do uh, the Burmese mountain tortoises. Those are really cool, but they get big, so keep that in mind. A lot of tortoises are very similar care until you get into like some of the really, really rare kinds. But if you're in a more arid climate, I would recommend the ones that I mentioned first. And if you're in more of a humid climate, you can do the last few that I mentioned. So. Alrighty, and last question on this very long Q&A Tuesday is Matt Ford. He asks, if you were to get a snake, which one would you get? There are a couple snakes that I would get right off the bat. I would definitely own a Dumeril's boa. Um, I would like to get an Emerald Tree boa. Either locality of White Lip Python are really cool. I think that's probably what I'd do. Those are like some of my top ones. I really want a Blacktail Kribo, but those are really, really hard to find here. I think that's kind of the list. I. I I wouldn't get any like ball pythons or corn snakes or anything like that. Um, it would be some of the, again, a little bit more uncommonly kept animals. But I think if you don't know about anything that I just mentioned, you should definitely look into them and uh, check them out because they are super interesting species. But that's going to do it for me, you guys. This was a really long Q&A Tuesday. I hope you guys enjoyed. If you did, smash that like button. Leave any questions, comments, concerns, anything like that in the comment section down below. Remember to leave your questions down below so I can answer them next week. And I think next week will be the last Q&A Tuesday of May Madness. So that's nuts. That's That went by so quick. But um, yeah, thanks for watching, you guys. If you enjoyed the video, make sure you click that subscribe button. Play Ding Dong Ditch with the doorbell next to it. And I want to thank you all very much for watching. We'll catch you tomorrow. Later.